or any Christian father that is worth his salt teaches his sons not to make fun of boys right. who are effeminate. Yeah. If you're a bad dad and you want to make more people like that and make their lives miserable and harm them forever, then go ahead right. and, 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 and despise sissies and be, be, say mean things about them in front of your sons. Yeah. But if you want real love and charity to, to prosper, then you teach your children to accept people in the personalities they have and evaluate morality according to the law of God. And don't give in on either one. Father Hugh Barber, thank you for being with us. Happy to be here. Uh, I want to talk to you about transgenderism and the whole uh, kind of this transgender movement. And it seems to me that so many people say, and I think they're right when they say this, this gets right to the core of what it means to be a human being. And when you get right... Almost. Almost right to the core. Almost right to, to the core. core. Close to the core. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Maybe you can we'll explain yeah. that more as we go. But when you think about issues of the, you know, what it is to be a human being, you think, well, what did Thomas Aquinas have to say about that? Because he had a lot to say about these profound things. Well, he did, but he said what he found in sacred scripture and in the tradition of the the revelation of the faith. So he found what's found in Genesis that I, God created man in His image. That's the real core. That's man the and, that's ma- the central core. Image. Right. And then male and female, God created him because man is a composite being of soul and body, and so is multiplied by procreation. Unlike angels, are multiplied by bang they're created right individually but man is multiplied by procreation uh, angels don't have mommy and daddy no other creature cooperated in the making of an angel god made them directly right but with human beings apart from adam the first man and eve who came forth from adam and even that's a cooperation uh all human beings come into existence by the power of god who creates their immortal soul and infuses it into the body generated by the cooperation of their parents through procreation, through intercourse. So man is made in God's image as to his soul or his spiritual nature, best best to say his spiritual nature, uh, made in God's image according to his understanding and his power to love, his intellect and his will. But then insofar as he can be duplicated, replicated, multiplied, then that requires procreation because bodies require a process of procreation. And that is why God created man in his image. And then it says right away in Genesis, male and female, he created them. Right. Right. You know, so oh, so that okay. it's, it's just this next step truth about God, man. Man is creating God's image. Man is created male and female so as to have more human beings after God's image. So the multiplication of God's image is the main thing. But that comes about for human beings not by the um, wild excess of God's goodness as he does with the angels, Just, but with a particular kind of goodness which allows the human persons who exist to cooperate in bringing forth new life as male and female. All right, well, then I'm going to ask you now a question that I had thought I would ask later because it seems to present itself immediately from what you just said, that if you say the core of the matter is God created man in his own image, and then the immediately following upon that is male and female, he created them. How do we address the person who will say, see, the main thing is that we are in God's image. The maleness and femaleness is just an accidental uh, of, our, of our person. It's not essential to who we are. Well, it's, it's essential for human nature as the common possession of the whole human race. Okay. Because you can't have new human beings ultimately. I mean, you, you can talk about the technological things they can do now to cause procreation. Oh, well, without, yes, right. But, but I mean, naturally speaking, you cannot uh, produce human beings without the cooperation of both sexes. And so um, uh, the, the, the distinction of sexes is part of the essence of human nature insofar as we're bodily, mm-hmm. but not insofar as we are uh, also spirits destined to uh, a life of contemplation of God and, uh, and the possession of spiritual goods, in which case men and women are not distinct. As St. Paul says in Galatians 3, in Christ there is neither male or female. And that's referring to the grace of baptism. You know, a little girl baptized is no less baptized into Christ than a little, uh, boy. Than a little boy because they all become members of Christ, the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which uh, this is where we can get into the gender ideologies maybe, is both male and female in its members. Yes. Christ the head is a man, like Adam was a man, but his body is both male and female. 
And indeed, in relation to him, all souls who are bodily are as female to Christ, the bridegroom, the one who renders him spiritually fruitful. But at that point, we enter into a realm of metaphor or analogy describing our relationship with God as though it were like the relationship between a man and a woman, even though in fact it is not. Yes. But it's used as an image in the scriptures to convey that to us. That's a whole lot in one answer, so maybe we can we can uh, chop it, it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, I well here's my if I, I'll, I'll go this direction. And we'll see if this if if this does chop it down a little bit. But so for someone like Thomas, who you said really derives his anthropology or his theory of or his understanding of what the human person is directly from the earliest lines of from sacred Genesis, scripture. right? Yeah. Um, not just from Aristotle. No. He uses right. Aristotle, but he doesn't get his anthropology from Aristotle. Just like he uses Plato, but he doesn't get his anthropology from Plato. He gets it from the Bible, from right. divine revelation. Right. And his faith permits him a certainty that this is true. That, right, exactly. That, that man in the collective is made, in, and in, in each individual case too, made in the image and likeness of God, and that male and female, he created them. So he starts there. He starts right, with, right, exactly. He doesn't start with, well, you know, but but there's certainly helpful insights in Plato right, and Aristotle, right. and that's so, part of yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I'm still not clear then if if you even in, in how you described it, how would a person how no let's not say a person like Thomas how might Thomas respond to the the claim of this transgender movement that there can be a difference between our physical sex. And what we are as as a person, our gender, so to speak. Well, he would respond in this way. He would say, looking at the human person with all of the faculties and powers of the soul, he would try to locate in that composite where the inclination, contrary to the biological sex, okay. would be found. So if you have a boy who's born male, I mean, he has male chromosomes, he's biologically a male, um, and that's, strangely enough, that's almost controversial even to say that, but that's that's the way it is, all right? So you have a boy who's born male who feels strongly, is convinced that he is actually female. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you have to locate that desire or that inclination somewhere in his nature. You can't locate it on the level of simply bodily nature because biologically he's male. Ah, that's I okay? see what you're saying. Yeah. So where are you going to locate that? You have to look at him and you have to say, well, um, he got it where? From some impression made on his senses, which entered into his imagination. Yes. Which and every form that we receive begets an inclination. He gets a desire or an aversion. So something came to his senses, which was collated into his imagination and his memory, which so affected them that he feels strongly that he would rather be female. Yes. Right? And therefore, you have to locate that particular uh, orientation towards defining his identity. You have to, you have to place it in the emotional life based upon past experience of this person. That's where you have to put it. Okay. That you, There's no denying. You have to respect people. When someone says, I want to be a woman, even though I'm a man, they probably do want to be a woman. Yeah. Now, or they may even be convinced that they are. Of course, right. Yeah. Right. The, the convinced or otherwise, some people may find that a painful inclination, which they resist and try to overcome. Others may, with a lot of help from other people nowadays, say, yeah. well, this is what I am, and yeah. so I'm going to assert it. Right. And that, that, uh, that's where it's found. So you have to say, well, in, in my nature, I'm a man. But should I desire not to be a man but a woman, that particular inclination will be found somewhere else in my nature but not in my bodily biological construct. Certainly not in my genitals. Right? No, Certainly it's not, not in my hormones. <laughs> Certainly not in any of that. Yes. But rather in an affect that is ah. an emotion which is generated by my past experience. And there are examples. People can have traumatic experiences of trauma associating with being male. I know of a case of a famous writer whose 
um, mother was uh, in perpetual um, mourning over the loss of her beautiful brother to uh, syphilis. This is the 19th century. And so when she found the little boy when he was five, touching himself and his genitals, she went nuts because she associated men with sexual pleasure and the death of her, her, her brother with this uh, syphilis coming from his running around. Right. And so she went to the kitchen and got a knife and she waved at the little boy and said, you know, if you ever do that, I'm going to cut those things off. Horrific trauma for To that a five-year-old. Okay. Yes. And so consequently, he took that for what it was worth. He loves his mother. He takes her word. This is something really bad. I should be something else. And therefore, the shame and the, the fear associated with, with having a penis and balls yeah. uh, made him not want to have them. Yes. Right. Or to have them from someone else who had them securely and assertively. Yes. And not uh, insecurely. Right. And in his, throughout the course of his life, and this is a Catholic writer, I won't name him right now, but he's, he's very well known in certain parts of the world and very much admi admired. He struggled with this his entire life. As one um, would. I mean, five right, years exactly. old, a horrible right, of course. threat from and so, one's mother. But, but that, that's there. Now, there might be on the other side uh, a less traumatic and more soft version where, you know, uh, daddy wanted a daughter. Yeah. And mommy doesn't have any problem with that because mothers, the, the initial identification of a child is with the mother and with the boy, especially, he has to make the transition to identifying with his dad and with his peers. But girls, that's no problem. They, they identify right away with their mothers and then they continue. And therefore, it's, not, it's a very diff diff different uh, kind of psychology. But the boy has to make this transition. Well, what if neither father nor mother are particularly interested in making that transition? The mother's perfectly happy to dress the boy up in girls' clothes or mm. to let him have girls' entertainments and identify with other girls and play with them and not do, not do anything uh, that would be expected of a little boy. The father respects his son's sensitivity, doesn't uh, do the normal male things with him, and he never identifies with masculinity. Yeah. And, they, and then they hear uh, a show on NPR, and then they, their little boy they says, go, you know, I'd like to be a girl. Yeah. And they said, yeah, that's right. So let's oh. go talk to the doctor. Yes. Now, that's a reality. That little boy has received such impressions in his life that he is convinced on the level of his emotions yes. that this is what he is. Not what he wants to be, but what he is. And, and when you say it's not physical, that, in other words, a scientist could deconstruct his body, examine it in every way, look in every single cell, and you would find no evidence of the female. It's not, he, th so not that's there. what you mean, that it's not no, arising other, from other the Other than the fact that men have estrogen too. So, you know, they can, yeah, right, you but, could have a case of some men have more testosterone than others, right. that kind of thing. But no, basically you've got it right there. There are certain cases of androgynous births where sure. they can't determine the sex, but the, ex those extreme cases, which are physical, still on the level of chromosomes, they're usually pretty clear, but even there, there's some there's some difficulties sometimes. But the, the extreme cases don't prove the point; they just prove that there's some disorder there sure. that's on the level of a physical right. disorder. Like people can be born with other chromosomal difficulties that also cause uh, deficiencies, or we might say nowadays we say more differences yeah. from other people. Okay, but that's right. that's something that has to be worked out on a very individual level. That's not a model for everybody. It, it does seem to me that the even I shouldn't say even certainly among our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, among many many Christians, and among many who are kind of part of the popular modern uh, religion, whatever it is that's left over from Christianity, has a sense that the soul is a thing within the body, mm -hmm. and that is not Thomas's view of the soul. That we no. might call a dualism, right, or a kind of dualism, right. And then there's another kind of modern modernity or, or modern way of th this. Look, the, the soul bit that all that soul business is a fantasy. You're just a physical body. That's what you are. And and so in that in the latter case, if you feel like a girl, be a girl because there's no the the truth of the matter is irrelevant. You're just a physical body, anyways. In the former case, maybe you do have a female soul in a male body. Yes, well, we would say, of course, as far as the spirit goes, that we don't distinguish sex according to spirit uh, because that would make two different 
kinds of being, men and women would be different natures altogether and not share a common human nature if there were female souls and male souls. Right. They differ by their body, but not by their souls. But um, it's important to keep in mind that um, the, uh, the uh, um, bodily nature of human beings is informed by the soul as a principle of life. The soul being immaterial, why do we say it's totally spiritual and material? Uh, because totally in the sense that it it's, it has those root of the power to to exist without a body, uh, because we have operations that we can perform that do not require a body, such as the generation of a universal concept from sense experience. Right. Nothing in sense experience is going to give you a universal of any kind. Right. Everything as we you see experience in... on the level of senses is something individual. Yeah. So the power that we can that we have to universalize our sense experience, our sense knowledge, shows that we have something that goes beyond the material, because the material order is only composed of individual material things. The universal notion comes by a spiritual nature. That is, there are only human beings, Joe, Jack, Mary, Paul, yeah. And, and all the other names according to ethnicity. Um, but human nature, humanity, is something which the mind perceives and really exists in those people, but is only perceptible to a spiritual faculty. So right. that is without matter. So the, the, the point you're really driving at is that we have an ideology that's come up, especially since the 60s in the universities, which began as a way of interpreting literature, of the postmodern or oh. deconstructionist movement right. where there's a basic and universal denial of natures in favor of materiality and brute experience so that um, there is no such thing as human nature. Uh, there is no such thing as an essence. Right. There's only your being and your ability to project your being in the world however you will. So basically there's being and willpower. And you decide what you want. And if you succeed in getting what you want, well, that's fine. If your life project, they call it. Or if you can succeed in that, fine. If you don't, well, it's too bad. But everybody is doing that. No one is actually um, living a life in order to fulfill the rules or the laws that apply to universal human nature as such in order to attain an end which is common to all human beings. Yes. And so then this, is, this ultimately devolves after several decades from being nerdy university analysis of literature right. all the way down to you can determine your reality and you can decide that you are female even if you are bodily and scientifically, we would say, male. Right. They can just say, science, that's a cultural construct. What I have is my experience yes. and what I want Right. And I can assert that, and no one has the right to oppose my right. And the only way to make society run is to just to have all these people doing whatever they want as long as they don't impede what somebody else wants. But that is almost an impossible world to maintain because right. you will have people disagreeing. And when they disagree, what do they do? They give reasons why they disagree. Oh, and all of a sudden we're back and into back, the... We're back to nature's and <laughs> yeah, arguments based right. upon reality. Yeah, yes, right. And so, you know, otherwise, I mean, if you're in a black room, you know, uh, with no light and no visibility whatsoever, and you could just sit there and throw stuff at other people and find a comfortable position and grab something to eat and whatnot without any notion of knowledge of anything whatsoever, but just survival of the fittest without any knowledge... Well, then you would have the kind of world that this sort of thing would lead to. Right. But fortunately, because God made a world that is full of natures and realities that can be ascertained rationally, nobody is able to be consistent in the application of this ideology. Nobody. No, it's not possible. It's right. not possible. It's not po because so you end up saying something like, there is no such thing as human nature, and you have no right to violate it. No, but like, 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 like the, it, it becomes a kind of moronic... Right, in this like, individualism, you say, well, well, um, uh, uh, well uh, Dad, I'm a girl. You can't say I'm not. And if you do, you're hateful. You hate me. Yeah. You're a hateful person. You're like, you're like Adolf Hitler. Yeah. All right, that's usually the, the it goes to there. <laughs> right. All right. And then Dad could say, hey, wait a minute. I'm an individual too. And I don't think you're a girl. Yeah. So, but you're not me. He said, what rule tells me that? 
Why can't I just make you a projection of me? I decide that you are me. <laughs> <laughs> and you are my identity, and you will be what exactly what I want you to be. Right. Now, where could, where could you use in this ideology, gender ideology, anything that would justify your main, maintenance of your individual dignity against someone else's claims? You, you have no ground you to stand on because you you've already said there is no human nature to defend. Right, exactly. And so you can just do it however you want. Um, this is very different from, for example, the, the problem... Uh, or the, the problem or the challenge or the reality, say, like traditionally of sexual morality per se, where you can analyze it according to male and female and say, well, okay, the mean of virtue in sexual matters is chastity in marriage, and that's a relation between man and woman for the sake of procreation of children. And then the excess of lust goes farther and farther away from that as you move along. So ad fornication, adultery, self-abuse, sodomy, bestiality, you go around the line, getting farther and farther away from the mean, but it's all a question of excess of lust. You know how to interpret it. But the world uh, in the late 19th century came up with new categories. Instead of just male and female, the psychologists gave us homosexual male, heterosexual male. Yeah, homosexual, homosexual female, female, heterosexual female. Oh, so now we have sexual identities that are based upon inclinations and not based upon bodily reality. Before they had those notions in the world that existed before, a man might have strong feelings for another man, but it was out of the question that he should act on them sexually. He got married and had children. There are very few men that are attracted to other men who couldn't, in an ideal world, under some circumstances, marry and be happy. Yeah. There are some men that are super masculine and have no inclinations towards their own sex, um, although there are a lot that do, but all of them could marry. You have these writers, C.S. Lewis, even while they said they went to boarding schools, kids behaved in various ways, but everybody married and had kids. Right. That was, it was not based upon this sort of psychology of identity based on inclination. Well, that stuff started. Of course, we can handle it because we're still dealing in the categories of male and female, irreducible because physical. Uh, right, right. And, and classically, no one wants to be a woman less than uh, a homosexual man, right. so-called homosexual. I don't like the term, but I'll just use it for now. Yeah. And no one wants to be a man less than a uh, homosexual woman. Right. So the sex aspect is clear. Um, but now we've moved to another realm where we're saying uh, that independently of sexual desire, you can choose your sex. And now yeah. we have a situation where there are men who want to be, to transition, as they say, to being female, but they still will maintain their uh, relations with the quote unquote opposite sex. What is that? Psychologically, it has to be analyzed. It has to be analyzed on the level of desire because it's no longer uh, a simple case of the assertion of masculinity over femininity, or as some feminists say, maybe it is. Because not only do I get to be a man, but I get to take your sex. That's why the old fashioned feminists now, no one will let them speak in public anymore because they're, lo lo they're, 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 they're lobbed with us yeah. because they maintain the distinction of the sexes. Right. And so the classic, like, like Gloria Steinem types, they say, no, no, if you weren't born a woman, you can't be a feminist. I mean, a, 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 re a re representative yeah. of a feminist uh, association. But then you have women's colleges like Smith and Mount Holyoke back east who are now forced to receive men who have become women as right. their students because they can't, they don't want to be identified with genderless essentialism. No. Right, so, right. so it's all gone completely stark raving mad, but there is a reason for it, as we can easily see. You simply separate sexual desire from sexual identity. And then you... Uh, yeah. end up with this situation you go back to a thing where you have men and you have women right and and the sexual desire can come and go and be what it is or but but you're still but, a man or a woman but you're a man or a woman and, and you're morally, made for the opposite right morally sex. and psychologically you have to evaluate your sexual inclinations you have to you have to make it reduce back to your sex yeah and then evaluate your desires in accordance with the reality the standard that your sex represents right so that and that's uh, that's the point. I mean, how many married couples would one come across in life, and it does happen, where the man is kind of effeminate and the woman is kind of tough? 
Yeah. And yet they're married and they have yeah. children and there's no issue there. No. The, 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 the stereotypical uh, marks of masculine and femininity, they work to a point. They are truly conventional. Uh, and normally people abide by them. But there are, there are always cases where they don't. Right. But if they observe the moral law, no one's going to point at that couple and go, that's disgusting. Now, they could if they're just emotionally immature. Yeah. And they just don't like the fact that he's a little light in his loafers and she's tough. Right. But they right. found each other. They love each other. They married. Yeah. And it's all working out fine. Right. And that's in accordance with the moral law. And that's the way it always was until this these identities were created, first homosexual, heterosexual. And then when they lifted the uh, the... Um, uh, the onus of psychological disorder from it in the 70s, everyone decided, well, it's a psychological disorder and now it's not anymore, so it must be okay. Yeah. And you have to go back to that and say, well, the church never evaluated sodomy as a psychological disorder. It was evaluated as an immoral act. Right. That was a physical, a physically immoral, immoral act. act. Right. And the various predispositions, like why you did it, all right, if you did it because you were in the Royal Navy in the 18th century... <laughs> All right, the British right. Navy is always used you for that. Pick on the Royal well, no, Navy. that's that's, that's yeah. the stereotype. Or well, or because you're in a prison or in a boarding school. Uh, boarding schools actually are better playgrounds for masculinity than co-ed situations where the boys are not uh, and the girls also are not challenged to identify with their own sex. So that stuff happened, but it's only because there were no girls around. Right. That's different. But you, the, all these things happen, but. But they, but um, they were never regarded as signs of psychological illness. They were just sins. Yeah, you just right. But then when they turn it into a creepy psychological illness, the shame element enters in, and so people. And that's in the nineteenth century, right? Nineteenth century, and then in the twentieth century, and so the people are eager. Please don't call me that because that means I'm crazy. Yeah. And then, and then you're ostracized. Where, and therefore, if you're going to lay hold of it, you're going to have to really make an an extra hard emotional effort to identify with what other people regard as craziness, and then you're stuck because yeah. you have really embraced uh, right. first a false view of your own condition and then uh, due to the expectations of society around you, which are completely false. The church just says, look, like St. Philip Neri said, have fun, boys, but don't sin. Yeah. That's it. Right. Divertitevi, ma non peccate. So and that, that, that's, that's the point, is that the, the individual inclinations, psychological predispositions, circumstances... All of that has to be evaluated, but the church is interested in men behaving as men sexually and women behaving as women sexually on the level of their bodies. And that means that they can only have sexual relations within a permanent marriage relationship, which is open to procreation because that's what our sex is ultimately for. Right. Because and we do have a nature. Right. We, exactly. <laughs> we do have a nature. And anything outside of that is either lust yeah. or... The rarer, St. Thomas says it barely has a name because it's so rare, the, the, the vice of, uh, of insensibility, people that have no sexual desire at all. Now, in this context, then, the transgender ideology, they talk about people that, are, that, are, that don't identify as either. They're, they're non-binary. Oh, yes, right. So okay. not male or female. Well, I just asked one question. Does that mean that you don't have sexual relations? Oh, I see. All right, because if, if by non-binary you mean I don't have sexual relations with people, I'm not identifying as male and female at all, then fine. But if you're having sexual relations, then at that point you are identifying in that action with either one or the other. You right. can't do both. You might switch around, but, but you're but, but your you're acts are binary. Yeah. You can't you can't you can't get around this. Yeah. Uh, by just saying I'm not bi binary, what you're actually saying is that your desires are sufficiently, or your affections. Your emotional life is sufficiently ambiguous that you kind of like some things about being male and kind of like some things about being female, right. and you combine them all. But this society has always managed these emotional uh, varieties perfectly well or not so well, depending. But as long as the moral order is upheld, there's a way around it. Yeah. There's some way to deal with this. But we have to start and, and stay firmly entrenched in the reality of male and female, then we can, we can avoid the um, cramped Victorian, Freudian, shame-based uh, pathologization right, of people's no personalities that. and desires. Don't make fun of the sissy that any Christian parent 
or any Christian father that is worth his salt teaches his sons not to make fun of boys right. who are effeminate. Yeah. If you're a bad dad and you want to make more people like that and make their lives miserable and harm them forever, then go ahead right. and, 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 and despise sissies and be, be, say mean things about them in front of your sons. Yeah. But if you want real love and charity to, to prosper, then you teach your children to accept people in the personalities they have and evaluate morality according to the law of God. And don't give in on either one. No. I accept you the way you are. I'm not going to judge your, your, your habits, your tone of voice, your gestures, or even your dress or anything like that. Just be accepting. And then you'll be able to, if you establish a friendship, to make some corrections or suggestions or give that person the confidence of your friendship or companionship so that, that the, the limitations that they place on themselves by their own behavior can be s gradually overcome. This can happen. Right. And, and that's part of the tragedy in our culture right now is that no one is doing anything for these kids. Well, I have to say, too, I, I mean, you, you're... Except you're telling them that it's all okay. Yeah, but, but your comment about men, I would like to add a comment about women because I've seen this many times, women sitting around talking about children. Uh, saying something like, oh, he's, you can tell he's gay because it's just a sweet little boy. He's just sweet. And th this, uh, I, this kind of gossiping about children in yeah. that way is evil. You well, should self, never, ever do that. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, someone should just say, so what? Teach yeah. him the commandments. Encourage him. Yeah. Make, make sure that he knows that he's a man and that a man is made as a man, strictly speaking, for union with a woman. Yeah. And he will manage. Yeah, because um, uh, uh, what you call homosociality—that is the fact that men associate with men and women associate with women—is an emotionally satisfying reality that all men and women have to have. Right. And if some, if a man is particularly inclined towards other men, well, then fine. You make sure that he has good associations with men so that he can develop properly in the right way. You don't immediately say, um, "Well, you know, I guess you're going to be." taking a trip to X part of town, yeah. you know, so you can find more of your kind, you know, right. that kind of thing. No, oh. you establish um, relationships that are broad, that are open, uh, that encourage an identification with other males as males. Yes. Uh, uh, but but uh, admiring them and whatnot, because there's always some level of homosexuality with, I'm just talking mostly about boys because this is the way it mostly works out. Female homosexuality is a different story, largely speaking, uh, that has more to do with um, um, a, a protective, nurturing environment that they want because of uh, the danger of associating with certain kinds of men who have hurt them or, they, or, the, or whom they view as threats, where it's a little different. It's more protective, whereas... Uh, male homosexual culture is not that protective. It's pretty. It can be pretty wild, you yeah. know. And and it because it's male, uh, and this is what the feminists don't like. <laughs> it's pretty much asserts that it should just be able to do anything it wants, you know. And right. It, it's not domestic in that sense, you know. It's not trying to no. to keep a quiet life going. And so, um, but but we we need to to uh, to recognize clearly that 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 the parents have a particular role in guiding little children. Uh, in the right way, without anxiety, without inducing shame, with encouragement, and with wisely looking at the opportunities they have to develop their identity according to the nature that God gave them. First of all, they're boys and girls. That's a very basic distinction that they all learn and they, they know right away without much training. But then in those things which express masculinity or femininity, to be careful to make sure that they are conveyed in such a way that if they don't get it right away, that they're not being shamed for it. Right. Um, and that, you know, like if the little boy picks up a doll, you know, you don't just grab it from him and slap him and say, don't do right. that. Here's a machine you know, gun. Right. No, you, 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 <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you behave in a way which is encouraging men like encouragement. They like, yeah. they like, they like being told they're great and that they can do things and, and, and encouraged to do things and overcome fear because so often there's just a fear there yeah. that the hesitant boy who's hesitant in the sports and whatnot, a kind coach, a kind father that kind of moves him along so that he, he can begin to identify with other boys. He may never, he may develop so that he still has that inclination, but he doesn't have to view it as something that he's required to act out on social, sexually. Right, or that it alienates him from other men. No, that, exactly, right, no, yeah. exactly. And that this is the problem is that with, with men like that, 
the very thing they need, they feel alienated for because of this late 19th century psychologization where everyone's yeah. ashamed of being nuts. And so they, they, if, you, if you look at that... And then parents are afraid of that for their children. Right. Is you look he at, this you look or at that? poetry or art yeah. or photography before this period. <laughs> you know, men showed great affection for each other. I mean, right. how many... And they do this now online. They do it like this is proof that they were gays forever. There's these <laughs> pictures of men sitting in each other's laps or hugging each other or touching each other. One, no, it was very Actually, common to have pictures, portraits made with your before best Before you friend. made everybody un uncomfortable, in other right. words. And there was no, <laughs> right. But, but then, then they created it as a, as a pathology, these, these nerdy... Yeah. Uh, Germanic uh, um, <laughs> people, and then they just they 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 made it so that uh, people became ashamed of that, and so yeah. all you can do is slap someone in the back, you know. Yeah, right. And exactly. because before it was very, you read Tennyson's In Memoriam, where he goes on and on an epic poem, all because he was completely devastated by the death of his friend, and now people say, well, that's gay. That goes in the gay studies program. Right. Well, no, it was just a Newman. man, a man in love with another man because they were friends. Friendship. Amicizia in Latin means lovingness. That's what it means literally, lovingness. And Augustine is a, a great example, his mourning for the death of his friend, where he said, I feared to die lest if I should die, he should die completely right. because he was half of my soul. Right. And he goes on and on and on about that. And Cardinal Newman, who determined that he should be buried not next to, but in the same grave as Ambrose St. John. And of course, all the clap trappers and the London tablet and all this liberal right. Catholic press and whatnot, they go on and say, well, see, there was a, a gay relationship. No, they were friends. Get it. Well, uh, l let me ask you read, this. Read, read, read Socrates in, in uh, the symposium and the end when Alcibiades comes to him and offers himself and Socrates says, what? I would give you gold and you would give me bronze? <laughs> you know, that was that was his reaction. Right. You know, it was a sound reaction. He was a pagan, but he knew this was not, this is, no. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's, 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 it's it's friendship, and but he didn't deny the affection, and he didn't he didn't humiliate Alcibiades. He just no. said, "Look, what you're offering me is not very right. good. I have something much better to offer you, namely the knowledge of the truth." Go well, ahead. the problem with Alcibiades is if you if you got him angry, he'd just join the other side and go to war against you. So yes, well, that's what aristocrats <laughs> are allowed to do because they've always got to be on the they always got to be on, on the, the winning, winning side, side. right? Uh, uh, okay, so we, you started by saying that Thomas's anthropology then of male and female is rooted in scripture. Is is our way out of the madness simply, and I don't mean this in, in a derogatory way because this is our great duty and the joy of our lives, simply the proclamation of the gospel to re return people to sanity, or should we busy ourselves also making philosophical arguments and, and whatnot to help restore some sense of sanity? Well, I'd say all of the above, of okay. course, I mean, depending upon what you've been given to, to do. Um, because, of course, obviously nature itself indicates the very same things, but revelation indicates it in a way which is uh, compact and portable. You mm -hmm. know, it's like that's what we believe is it's in the scriptures. Um, but um, the what we have to do is to assert the reality of nature and to assert it calmly while not uh, ceding to the accusation that what we're saying is hateful. One approach I've used with several people who have come to me about these things rather vehemently is just to say, well, what about Orthodox Jews? They have a lot of rules about what is pleasing to God and what is not, ceremonial rules. Now, we Christians are no longer bound by the ceremonial precepts of the old law, but a lot of their rules are not just ceremonial, they're moral. Orthodox Jews teach that homosexuality is wrong. They teach also that, that abortion is wrong. They have strict limitations on uh, the, the way in which men and women relate in marriage, much stricter than ours, and so on. Um, are they haters? Are they awful because they keep kosher? So just say, why don't you give us Catholics a little slack? Yeah. I believe, because you're going to have to say this more and more, because there'll be lots of people who just simply cannot see what we're saying and will view it as hateful. You, use the religion card. Say, this is my faith. This is what I believe. I'm not going to hurt you, right. um, but this is what we believe, and we also believe that it should be true for you. Because unlike the ultra orthodox Jews, we would be happy if you would become one of us. Right. We actually evangelize. They do, some of them do, the, the Lubavitchers and whatnot, but most of them don't evangelize. They're very careful about that because they want to maintain those rules. Whereas we are 
are open and we evangelize and so that we welcome people, even people who don't quite get it. That's why uh, on the progressive side of things, they're not wrong by saying that Catholic parishes should be open to whoever shows up. There may be rules of prudence that yes. you have to use in order to not to distress families and whatnot, but still no one should feel like he or she or they or whatever it is that people are saying yeah, nowadays right, right, or could be what, able yeah. to, to enter a Catholic church and pray and be turned away because they're treated like a freak. Yeah, no. Because right. that's the, uh, people, that is not, it's not right. On the other hand, we have to hold firm with what we teach and be, be very firm about it and persevering. The church has given us in the recent magisterium two truths which are not dogmatically defined at the highest level but which are still are most certainly infallibly taught by the universal ordinary magisterium of the Roman pontiffs. One is the immorality of artificial contraception. Yes. Or contraception in general. The other is um, that women cannot be ordained to the sacramental priesthood. Okay, between those two truths, one of which is very fundamental and natural, that basically says that sex is for procreation. Even though, yes, 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 it's for the union of the couple, there's a secondary end, but we need to get back to the language of not treating those two ends, procreation and union, as co-equal. If you don't have the procreation part, the union is going to get you where we are now. Yeah. Okay, You have to have it. And that's what Paul VI was teaching, basically, by saying that you are not allowed to engage in sexual activities which are not, at least in some way, open to procreation, or at least where you are not deliberately blocking it. Yes, right. Um, so that so that, uh, so that it can't happen. If it can't happen, there's a physical reason in you, but it's not something you did, right? So that, that gives the bottom line about sexual morality right there. You can't prevent conception and claim that it's a moral sexual act. And therefore, that rules out all um, immoral sexual activity, including adultery and fornication, because those are about the circumstances in w are, which are necessary in order for procreation to occur. And including uh, you, your list went out to uh, self-abuse and bestiality, too. All, way, all, all of it is things. covered. It's uh, all covered. Right. All right. But, but, but even adultery and fornication, they're, they're only more natural in the sense that they can bring forth uh, children. But St. Thomas says all the sins of, against chastity are, are against nature in the sense that they are contrary to reason. And you need stable married life uh, to raise a child, and therefore you have to, to rule out adultery and you have to rule out fornication because those, those offend the stability of marriage or the existence of marriage. So all sexual sins are related to the, the reality of procreation and education of children. That we have to maintain. Then that women cannot be ordained to the sacramental priesthood. That means that a human society at its height, which is beyond the political order in the sacramental order, that is our conformity to Christ through his sacraments, the offering up of the Eucharist, and the, and the gathering of the peoples into Christ's body, is governed by an awareness of the distinction of sex on the level of sacramental signs, that they point to something heavenly. And therefore, we're not allowed to ignore them as though the priesthood were simply some kind of, uh, of job which a man or woman could equally well perform. But rather, there is the contemplative sign value of something which the world does not understand because the world uses signs only to make money, only to satisfy. No, it's exactly true. I see what you mean. Only to satisfy. It's it's back to you know the the, the hidden persuaders. You know, yeah. it's back to those that those old studies or or Marshall McLuhan studies in in communications and advertising and all that. It's it signs are used for that there, but but for us the signs are markers of what is ultimate and eternal. Now on that score, then Saint Paul can then tell us once we're incorporated into Christ in baptism and are destined for heaven, we all relate to Him as the great high priest and spouse of our souls, even though Christ represents, even though a priest represents Christ the head at the altar as a sacramental priest, an instrument of Christ, the only full priest, um, still it remains true that as a man, as an individual human being, he relates to Christ as the bridegroom. But again, now we're moving from nature to mm -hmm. analogy, yeah. and you find out that Christianity has in it a tradition which is not transgender, but which relativizes and uh, and and sublimates sexual distinctions into the relationship we have with Almighty God, so that the the whole church is like a bride coming out of heaven to meet her bridegroom, and that's all of us. Yes. And the saints in the Middle Ages, 
even the male saints spoke of the spiritual life in terms of the Song of Songs, yes. where the soul is the bride and Christ is the bridegroom. Now, there are some modern Catholic uh, people scandalized by the gender ideology who have written nasty works complaining about the exegesis of the Song of Songs as being the root of too much feminization in the church. Well, they should be just chastised because we don't reject the fathers and the doctors of the church just because we're pissed off that, you know, in our own culture, there's men are confusion having trouble on being men. Right, yes. exactly. Don't blame St. Bernard, okay? <laughs> he was a man's man in, Boy, the, was in he. the toughest possible yeah. way. So don't blame his commentary on the Song of Songs. <laughs> Just look at the culture and the post-Cartesian culture, which separated the soul from the body, um, at least in popular understanding. That wasn't Descartes' exact intention, but that's what came out. Um, but let's just um, assert these things to know that you know if 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 you if you, you still are free as a Christian to relate to Christ as your spouse, to relate to Him as though you were female on the level of the spiritual life. Now that doesn't mean you're supposed to like you know whatever. I don't know what would be psychologically healthy, but the fact is the doctrinal truth is such that our relationship with Christ is so beyond understanding that it exceeds and outstrips the limits of our bodily nature, while we remain united to Him because He is God. So uh, there is that aspect which, properly understood, shows how broad is the Christian perspective. But it's very different from this transgender stuff, I have to say. Sorry. It, yeah. You don't have to say sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just that, you know. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry as in like, sorry, I have to disappoint you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Father. Uh, may we have your blessing? Certainly. Okay. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and by the mercies of Christ, spouse of souls, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Went a bit long on that episode, but I have to say I enjoy chatting with Father so much. I just enjoy listening to what he had to say. I was very happy to hear him, and, and I didn't expect it, to ground the, the current gender uh, problems that we're having in literary studies or in, in literature departments of the 1960s and 70s. That is without question the case where this idea of deconstructionism, I think that Walker Percy called that an apocalyptic philosophy uh, got underway, and now we're reaping the fruits of that apocalyptic philosophy. So much there. We'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email anytime. Just send it to focus at catholic.com, focus at catholic.com. If you'd like to support us, we would appreciate your support. You can do that by going to give catholic.com give catholic.com also if you're watching on youtube don't forget to like and subscribe that helps to grow the podcast more than 130,000 subscribers uh, now and heading towards 200,000 and if you're listening on apple spotify stitcher or any other podcaster service if you would give us that five star review and maybe write a few nice words that'll help to grow the podcast i'm psych your host thanks so much for joining us again we'll see you next time right here on catholic answers focus <laughs>